Well, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately in some of your minds, uh, this is probably going to be my last Sunday here at Thornydale Family Church for quite some time. You see, over the last couple of weeks, I've been getting these phone calls from the IRS, and, and they told me that if that I didn't pay all my taxes, and that if I didn't immediately go down and get a prepaid debit or credit card and pay my taxes, that they were going to come and arrest me. So I may not be here, you know, next week. Now, obviously, I'm being a little facetious because we all know that that's a hoax, and the IRS has had to come out and put out all this information and say, hey, look, folks, this is just a hoax. The IRS, if you really owe some taxes, they're not going to give you a phone call. They're going to send you probably a certified letter in the mail and let you know that. And so so a lot of people, I, I don't know how people get caught up with all these hoaxes because, frankly, there's some pretty easy ways to figure out if these things are a hoax. Talked a little bit about that last week. If you were with us at the, uh, the Sunrise Service, talked about some of the, the all-time greatest hoax, hoaxes that have been played on people on April Fool's Day. But, but these kind of hoaxes that are played on people, they're not... They're not limited to just one day of the year, are they? They're all around us. Some of you may have, uh, if you're on Facebook, have seen this uh, picture of Bill Gates where he's offering to pay $5,000 if you will just share this post on your timeline. Now, I'm not going to embarrass anyone here this morning and ask how many of you that are on Facebook actually shared that on your timeline. I'm not going to do that. However, I did see a couple of you, and I know you did that, so um, I'm not going to single you out. I know some of you got caught up by that. What, what's really obvious here is this is some kind of a hoax. What somebody did, some prankster, they took this picture, this next picture, which was uh, done during a, an interview kind of thing that Bill Gates did on Reddit, and obviously they photoshopped the other stuff into it. And, and frankly, there's some pretty easy ways for us to, to figure out if these things are a hoax. And frankly, if you're a Christian, I think you have a responsibility before you go on sharing these things on places like Facebook and other social media, I think you have a responsibility to actually check those things out and make sure if they're really true before you go passing them on to other people. I think we have that responsibility. So there's places to do that. Now, that's all good and great, but what about if it's hard to really tell if something is true or not because we just don't have the original documents or we can't really go back to the source or there's not something else out there on the the internet or somewhere else that would allow us to kind of figure that out. And what what if that's really important because whether or not this particular item is true or not, whether it's reliable or not, really has an impact on our lives. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. This morning I'm going to begin a a five-part series where we're going to be dealing with some of the hard questions that that deal with our faith, that deal with God, that deal with the Bible, with Jesus Christ. And and obviously a lot of us have questions about those kind of things, don't we? Whether you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, been His disciple for a long time, whether you're not yet His disciple, it's likely that you have some questions about God and about Jesus, and about the Bible, and about what it means to to have faith. And so we're going to be dealing with some of those things over these next several weeks. And I've got good news for you. If if you have questions, God is okay with that. Did you realize God's okay with that? I I was looking at a commentator this week, and I didn't go back and verify it because I didn't have time, but he says that there's over 3,000 questions in the Bible. And that the Bible is really given to us to answer a lot of those questions that we we have. And God's not afraid of our questions. I mean, look all throughout the Scriptures at all the people who ask questions of God. Think about Moses. Man, Moses asked some questions of God, didn't he? Did it face to face with God and asked him questions about that. David certainly did that. Go look, read some of the Psalms that David wrote. He had a lot of questions about God. And he wrote those down in the form of the Psalms, and we have them in the Scriptures today. There were some like Philip and Thomas who had the opportunity to ask their questions of Jesus himself. And so God's not at all afraid of the questions that that we might have. And so we're going to deal with a few of these questions over the next five weeks. Obviously, we can't answer all those questions, 
but there's some that we can. And the one that we're going to start with this morning is really kind of foundational to all the rest of us. And here's the question that we're going to ask and answer this morning. How do I know the Bible is true? Because everything else we do is is based on the, the Word of God here. And if I can't know if that's true or not, then then really everything else that we do as, as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, it all really all rests on that, doesn't it? So we need to understand why the Bible is true. And perhaps you've had some questions about it, and I'm, I'm almost sure that you've had other people ask you questions about, well, how do you, yeah, just because the Bible says it, how do you know the Bible's true? And just think, think for a moment about some of the kinds of objections that you've heard from people over the years about the Bible. What are some of the things that they, they bring up? Maybe some things like this. Well, they, they might say something, well, the Bible's just this like collection of a- ancient fables and myths that somebody put all together. Or they'll say something like this, well, the Bible's been changed so many times over the year, how do you know it's really reliable? Heard questions like that before? Or the Bible's just written by a bunch of men. It's not God's Word. It's just, it's just what a bunch of men wrote down. Or they'll claim that the things that, that are in the Scriptures, they, they can't be true because there's no, no real evidence that they happen. There's no archaeology. There's no history that would, that would confirm the things that are written in the Scriptures. Probably one of my favorite ones is they'll claim, well, the Bible's just full of a whole bunch of contradictions and errors. Ever heard some things like that? Well, I'm gonna I'm not gonna be able to answer all of those this morning in the time that we have. But what I want to do is I want to take and and approach this from a more positive point of view this morning. I want to look at at some reasons that we have that we can know that the Bible is true. And as I do that, I'm hoping to accomplish two things this morning. First of all, I want to make sure that all of us here leave here today with confidence that this is, in fact, the Word of God, that it's true, that it's something that we can rely upon in our lives, that we can use it as a guide for the way that we live out our lives on a daily basis. That's important, don't you think? But the second thing I want to do is that that when people come to you with these kind of objections, I want you to be able to answer those objections and to have some tools to do that So that's what we're going to do this morning. So how how can I know that the Bible is true? How can I really know that? We're going to look at eight things this morning that will help us to do that. And this is going to be a little bit different type of of sermon than what you're used to. Usually what do we do? I, I start with God's Word and we read it, and then we let the text take us wherever we're going to go. And I'm going to do a little bit of that at the beginning, but, but frankly, that wouldn't do a very good job of proving that the Bible is true, right? I mean, it'd be like me taking one of those other books and, and the author said something in here. He says, well, I say it's true, so it's true. It's kind of that circular reasoning, right? And so we're going to look at some things that are in the Scriptures, but, but we're also going to look at some things outside the Scriptures that will help us to have great confidence that this is really, truly God's Word this morning. So we're going to we're going to look at eight of those things together this morning. And the first one we're going to look at is this internal consistency or internal claims that we find in the Bible. There are these internal claims that, that throughout the Bible we find the Bible claiming to be the Word of God. Again, another commentator, and I, I didn't count all these up, but one I read this week said that there are over 4,000 places in the Scriptures where it reads something like, God said, the Lord said, the word of the Lord came to so-and-so. All those kind of things. And so over and over throughout the Scriptures, the Bible claims that it is, in fact, the Word of God. Now, I don't know too many other books that claim that. There's probably a few out there. And if this were the only thing we had, I, I, I'd agree that's, that's not going to prove it. But there are these internal claims. And both Paul and Peter write about those things in their letter. The Apostle Paul, writing to Timothy, wrote this in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He said, All Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what he says here is that, that this, the Bible is breathed out by God. And Peter says something very similar to this in 2 Peter. 
he, uh, he writes this. He says, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so what we find here in the Scriptures is there, there's both this, there's this human element, element and there's a divine element. And, and we know the Bible is written by a lot of different authors, and, and God uses who those people were. He uses their personality. He uses their writing style. He uses the language that they wrote these things in. And they're all different, and you can see that all throughout the Scriptures. I mean, look at one of David's Psalms and compare it to one of Paul's letters. They don't look anything alike, do they? And so God uses this, this human element. He, he uses who people were. But what these verses tell us is there's also a divine element that every single word that they wrote down was, was breathed out by God through these men. That the Holy Spirit guided every single word that they wrote down on the paper. So you have these, these internal claims, first of all, that the, that the Bible is the Word of God. Obviously, that's not the only thing that, that, that would make us believe it. If that's all we have, but it's important. The second thing we have is we have the testimony of Jesus. In John chapter 17, Jesus said this. He said that your word is truth. Speaking of the word of God. And not only that, think about this. Jesus testified to the truth of God in a lot of other ways too, didn't he? Think about all the things he did. How many times did he quote Old Testament scripture? You think Jesus would have quoted the Scripture if it wasn't really God's Word? He quotes the Scripture. Not only does he, does he quote it, but he talks about the events that were recorded in the Old Testament. Things like He talks about things like Jonah and, and things that people would dispute are really true. But Jesus talked about them. Jesus, what does He do at the beginning of His ministry? He gets up and He unrolls the scroll of Isaiah and He begins to preach the Word of God. So, so Jesus, through his words, through his life, over and over, he testified that that was the word of God. The third thing that we have that proves that this is the word of God is this internal consistency. What if I were this morning to take and appoint 10 of you? I just choose 10 of you at random. And I was get to give you this assignment. You have one year to write a book about the meaning of life. And you all came back here a year from now, and you turned in your books. How consistent do you think they would be? Probably not very much at all, right? You wouldn't even all have the same theme alone, the same, same sub points and things like that. There wouldn't be any consistency at all. And that's even though you all speak the same language, you all live in the same community, you even all go to the same church, and yet those would be completely inconsistent. Now let's think of another book, a book written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 different authors in three different languages. What are the chances a book like that could be consistent, right? And yet that's the Bible. And it's completely consistent from beginning to end. It's the same theme woven all throughout the book. Here's, here's what's really amazing to me. Think about the Bible like this for a moment. Think about that the Bible begins in the book of Genesis, which is written by Moses, and it begins where? In a paradise. And what's in the middle of that paradise? A special tree. And then when you get to the other end of the Bible in the book of Revelation, who's written by, which is written by John, what do you have at the end of Revelation? You have another paradise. And you have a special tree in the middle of that paradise. And the entire scripture, all 66 books written by 40 different authors, tells the story of what God did to make it possible for man who got kicked out of that first paradise because of his sin to be able to live in that second paradise because of what Jesus has done for us. That's pretty amazing, isn't it, when you think about it? That there could be that kind of of internal consistency in the Word of God. The next reason that we have, the next proof that we have is this, history and archaeology. A lot of people over the years have, 
have claimed, well, man, you can't prove all this stuff in the Bible. I mean, there's no, there's no historical support for it. You, can't, you just can't find it. And there's been a lot of things over the years where people thought they just, the, the, the history and archaeology just contradicted what was in the Bible. But you know what happens? Every year we find more and more stuff, especially in archaeology. And guess what? The more we find, the more we find that it supports what the Bible says. Christianity Today, every single year for I don't know how many years now, they've come out with the top 10 biblical archaeology finds of the year. And every one of those things lends support to what's, what we find in the Scriptures. And I could give you hundreds, thousands of examples, but I'm going to give you just two this morning that I think are really important. The first one is Jericho. Most of us are, are familiar with Jericho. They're in Joshua chapter 6, remember, where the Israelites marched around Jericho and the walls came tumbling down and they went in and they captured the city and for a long time people said that's just not possible. I mean walls just don't come tumbling down and besides they would say the city of Jericho was so big that there's no way the Israelites could have marched around it seven times in one day. And guess what happened? In the early 19, I think about the 1930s, there was a guy named uh, John Garstang and several other archaeologists, and, and they actually found the walls of Jericho. And guess what they found? The walls of Jericho, when you, when you capture someone like that, what would you think? The walls would fall in, right? But guess what happened? They had evidence that the walls actually fell out. Just like the Bible said, not only did the walls fall out, but when they fell out, they actually formed these ramps. So that the Israelites could have marched right up over the walls into the city exactly what it says in the book of Joshua. Exactly. And not only that, they found out that this fortified city of Jericho, it really wasn't all that big at all. The Israelites could have marched around it seven times in a day and still had time to go out for dinner that night. It just wasn't that big, so they proved it. The other example I want to share with you is the example of the Hittites. And, and the Hittites are mentioned probably close to 60 times in the Scriptures. And for a long time, people said, well, there's absolutely no evidence there was ever anyone called the Hittites. Probably the one we're, the Hittite we're most familiar with is Uriah, who was the husband of Bathsheba. He was Uriah the Hittite. And for a long time, people said, there's no evidence there was ever that culture. And guess what happened? In the early 1900s, there was a an archaeologist over in Turkey, and he, he, he uh, discovered this cave, and they found all these, these pots with inscriptions and stuff on them. And guess what? It took him a while, but once he deciphered all the stuff that was on that pottery, guess what they found? Historical references to the Hittites. And so history and, and archaeology, they support the fact that the Bible is really true. Not only that, there are all kinds of historical records that, that talk about Jesus. Most of them written within about 150 years of when he was here on earth, so they were very close to that time. And they talk about Jesus. They, they tell us he was a historical figure. They tell us about his death and, and about his resurrection and about his teaching. So we have all these historical records outside the Bible that all show us that, in fact, this Word of God, the Bible, really is true. Next one I want to talk about is scientific accuracy. And the, the Bible is not a science book, but it's scientifically accurate. And this one's so important that I'm going to actually deal with this in, in the last sermon in our series. So, so I'm not going to really spend a whole lot of time here other than just to kind of mention it. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. And in a few weeks, we're going to talk about the fact that, that even though people say that science contradicts the Bible, that that is not really the case. The next one that, uh, that we want to look at this morning is manuscript evidence. <laughs> this, this one here, frankly, we could, we could spend the whole time just on this one real easily. And I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about and studying about these things and and. and and if you'd like, I can give you some material so you can go back and, and look at that because all I'm going to be able to do in the time we have this morning is to just barely scratch the surface here. You see, I have to admit, we don't have any of what are called the original autographs. 
I'm not talking about when you go to the baseball park and get an athlete to sign, but those were the original documents. For instance, we don't have any of Paul's letters that he wrote anymore. We don't have the originals of any of those. So then the question becomes, well, how do we know that, that what we have here is really true? Well, we have all kinds of manuscripts. Manuscripts are, are really just copies of all these things that were all done by hand before the printing press was, was uh, invented. And we have all kinds of different, different little fragments here and there. So how do we know that what we have today is, is really true? I mean, after all, people claim these things were copied year after year after year, and all kind of mistakes would have crept in. Well, let me just tell you, first of all, the thing that's amazing is the number of manuscripts that we have. We have more manuscripts of the Scriptures than of any other ancient writing out there. And that, that alone ought to tell us something about how God has preserved His Word over all these years, over, over 3,500 years that God has preserved His Word. So we have all these documents. And for a long time, people would claim, well, these copies really aren't all that accurate. I mean, think you copy them over and over again. Well, the Jews, they had this very meticulous system of how they would, how they would copy down the Scriptures. And, and man, if they made even one mistake, they would tear it up and they would burn it and they would start over again. And we know that they did it very accurately because, and I think it was around 1947, somewhere around there, where a shepherd boy was out in Qumran. And he came across this cave, and in this cave he found what we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls are amazing. There are, there are at least fragments of every single book of the Old Testament that were found there, except for the book of Esther. And when they took those fragments and they compared them to the Masoretic text, which is, which is what most translators use to, to translate our Old Testament, they found that there was a 95% consistency between these old fragments that dated back to before Christ and, and the, the Masoretic text, which was compiled in about uh, 1000 A.D. And that might seem, well, there, there could still be some errors, right? You know what? Out of the 5% where there was inconsistency, it was stuff like this. A, a letter wrong here or there. Maybe a word misspelled i could do that if i was copying something down right you guys could do that maybe a punctuation mark here and there but none of that impacted the the overall message of the scriptures and when it comes to the new testament scriptures we have in total about thirty thousand different manuscripts thirty thousand again no other ancient book has nearly that many manuscripts out there there's about i guess uh you know, we have them in Greek, we have them in Latin, we have them in some other languages. And again, what we find is there's tremendous consistency among all these different manuscripts that we have. So what we find, the evidence is, is that God, in a very supernatural way, has protected His Word as over time it's been copied down and copied down and copied down. What's really fascinating to me is, is I began to do some more research on this, is that if we had none of these manuscripts at all, if we didn't have any of the Bible manuscripts, do you realize that we could, we could come up with almost all of the New Testament just based on the, the writings of the early church fathers? Because guess what they would do in, in their sermons? They would quote from the Scriptures and they would write them down. And if you just took all the stuff that's not even in the Bible, you could reconstruct almost all of the New Testament. That's pretty amazing. I mean, I was thinking about that in, in today's culture. You can almost do the same thing. I, I post most of my sermons on a site called um, Sermon Central. And I was just thinking about that. If someone were to go to Sermon Central today, I'll bet they could reconstruct about 95% of the Bible just from the quotes of the Scriptures that pastors have written down in their sermons over the last 10, 20 years, whatever. So God's preserved His Word in an amazing way. The seventh thing we want to look at this morning is prophecy. And it, if you're not convinced already, this should convince you. Because there's so many prophecies in the Scripture that have all come true. Every year in our, in our family, when the NCAA basketball tournament rolls around, we all complete our little brackets and, and fill those out. And this year, I'm really sad to say that my daughter, Pam, had the best bracket. 
Not only that, it was so good, it was in the top 1% of all the brackets submitted to ESPN in the entire United States. That's pretty good, right? But guess what? Out of the 63 games that she had to predict, I think she got like 43 of them right, which isn't bad, but, but 43 out of, you know, about two-thirds of them, something like that. When it comes to the Scriptures, however, and the prophecies are in the Scripture, guess what percent of them always came out the way God said? 100%. You cannot find one prophecy in the Scriptures that you can disprove or say that it never came true. Some of them are still waiting fulfillment, but there's none you can prove are wrong. I remember when I first studied the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel to me is just, it's an amazing book because in the book of Daniel, when I started studying, I realized that hundreds of years before it happened, Daniel accurately predicted who was going to be ruling over the Israelite people for the next hundreds and hundreds of years. He knew it would be the Babylonians and then the Medes and the Persians were going to come in and after that the Greeks and finally the Romans. And he, he predicted that hundreds of years before it happened. He even predicted the very day that Jesus would come riding on a donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You can calculate that out to the day using Daniel's prophecies. And that's just one prophecy about Jesus. There's probably about 300 or so prophecies about Jesus' first coming. And guess how many of them Jesus fulfilled literally and exactly? All of them. Every single one. There was a professor named uh, Peter Stoner, and he wanted to kind of to, to demonstrate to his math students just how unlikely this was. So what he did is he had a project for his students, and he took just eight prophecies about the coming of the Messiah. Ones that could be pretty easily, you could kind of figure them out. Stuff like the fact that he was born in Bethlehem. Or that he was born to a virgin. And then what they did is they they used these very conservative assumptions. And they said, what are the chances that one person could fulfill just eight of these 300 prophecies? And, And they figured out that from the beginning of time until he published his materials, I think about 1958, he published them, that the chances that any one person could have fulfilled all eight of those was one in 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 with 17 zeros after. I don't know what number, how, what you even call that number. I know it's big, right? It's a lot. I mean, I was thinking about this. The odds of winning the Powerball are something like one in... 250 or 275 million. So the chances that Jesus could fulfill all those are something like 5 trillion times less even than that. And you know what the odds are of winning the lottery? Not very good, right? Well, well, Stoner explained it in an even illustrated an even better way than that. He says, here's what that's like. He says, if you could take silver dollars and you could get 10 to the 17th silver dollars you could pour them out over the state of Texas and it would cover the entire state two feet deep. And he said, then if you could just pick out one of those silver dollars and you could mark it specially and you could throw it out there in the middle and you could mix them all up and you could set somebody at one end of the state of Texas with a blindfold on and tell them, just go out and find that one silver dollar. He said, that's about the odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight prophecies. Pretty amazing, isn't it? There's one more thing that I want to look at this morning that's proof that that the Bible is true, and that is the power it has to transform lives. Again, if this is all we had, I couldn't prove the Bible by it, but I tell you what, when you combine it with all the other things that we've already looked at this morning, I think it's a pretty convincing proof. Because what's happened is over the years, The Bible has transformed both individual lives and it's transformed entire cultures. I know it's true in my own life. I know that the Word of God has transformed my life. When When I grew up, it wasn't like I was entirely rebellious against God. I just didn't really have a whole lot to do with Him. And then one day when I was in college and Mary and I were dating and 
I've shared you with this before. She asked me to go to church with her, and I wasn't really keen on the idea. I'll be real honest. But I liked her enough. I figured, okay, I could go to church once. And something happened. That first day I went to church with her, I, for the first time in my life, I heard somebody preach the Word of God in a way that was relevant to my life. And so I went back again the next Sunday because I want to hear some more of that. And the next Sunday, and the next Sunday, and guess what? After a while, God's Word had spoken into my life and revealed some things about my life that, that weren't particularly comfortable, but which I needed to understand. I wasn't a bad person. I, I didn't go around killing people. I wasn't a real wild party guy or anything like that. But what I began to realize is that I was a sinner and that my sin separated me from God and that the only way that I could be made right with God was through Jesus Christ who came to this earth and who died on a cross to pay the penalty for my sins. And so what? guess what? God's word completely transformed my life. And it's been doing the same thing every day since then as I read and study and apply his word to my life it changes my life it's made me not a perfect but a better husband it's made me not a perfect but a better father it's made me not a perfect by any means but a better pastor as i've allowed god's word to transform my life and god wants to do the same thing with you but not only is this a proof this idea is also is also a challenge to us i think too because if, in fact, God's word is really true, then, then we have to decide what we're going to do about it. We have to make the decision. If, we're gonna, if we really believe this is true, we really believe it's the word of God, if we really believe it's reliable, then will we live our lives based on what God's word says? So it's a proof and it's a challenge. But not only is God's word transformed individuals like me and like probably most of you in this room, it's also transformed entire cultures as, as the cultures are based on God's Word. I mean, think about our country when it was first formed, when it was formed on biblical principles. It, it was transformed by the fact that there were a lot of people who were living based on God's Word and, and as a nation, that the nation was founded based upon God's Word. And so, so over the years, God's Word has transformed people and it's transformed cultures. And like I say, that's... That's a proof, but it's also a challenge to us, isn't it? Because we have to decide, are we going to really take God's word and live by it in our lives? You see, if all you do is come here, in here this morning and you leave and you think, well, yeah, I believe the Bible is true. Now, that's good. But unless you really believe it to the point that you're willing to change your life based on what's written there, then, then frankly, we haven't really accomplished a whole lot here this morning. So here's what I want to do to kind of to just reinforce this idea in our lives of the fact that God's word can transform our lives. I want you to take out your Bibles and turn to Psalm 119. If you don't have a Bible or some in the seat backs in front of you. Fortunately, Psalm 119 is pretty easy to find because if you just kind of open your Bible to the middle, you're going to be probably in the Psalms somewhere or pretty close to them. And then you can find Psalm 119. And you will notice in Psalm 119 that it's arranged into these verses or, or stanzas, each one of which begins with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to pick out just one stanza. I don't care which stanza you pick out. You know what? This is an amazing psalm. Because I will guarantee you that no matter which stanza of Psalm 119 that you pick out, that God will speak to you this morning about His Word. So pick out any one. I don't care. Pick one out. And I'm going to give you just like a few minutes to just read that through several times. And just silently as you sit there to pray. And to thank God for His Word and what it does in your life. So, so does everyone understand what we're going to do? Take, find one stanza. Just meditate on it by reading it over silently for a few minutes. Pray about that and ask God just to speak to you about his word. Thank him for his word and what it does in you.